Well, I'll start. I'm Kayla. I'm Megan. I'm Anne. Welcome. Everybody freeze. There are silent predators among us, and we are not leaving till we get to the bottom of this. Well, that's not going to be very hard because they live right under our feet. If it didn't say, they were claimed to be this big. If it didn't be, their color was this. And if it didn't see, they were found in this plant. This is what they look like in the adult form. Welcome, I'm Kayla. I'm Anne. And I'm Megan. We are JB Lightning. Lightning. Today, we will be talking to you about the Papilia japonica. The Papilia japonica are becoming more of a problem to control and prevent them from destroying agriculture plants. Throughout our presentation, we will be giving clues for you so at the end of the presentation you can guess what we commonly call the Papilia japonica. At the end, you'll be able to guess what its common name is and you can also ask any questions. So just to make sure, our challenge for you is to find the Papilia japonica's common name. We have a quote of the day for you. The first day, one is a guest the second a burden, and the third a pest. We believe this is true because the Papilia japonicas have outstayed their welcome in the U.S. and it's time for them to go. So this is our sore paragraph about the Papilia japonica. Here's the taxonomy about the Papilia japonica. And as you can see, the genus is Papilia and the, speci the species or scientific name is Papilia japonica. The Papilia japonica were originally from Japan. They were brought to the U.S. in 1916, mid-August, but they were not identified until 1917 by Harry B. Wells and Edgar Lee Dickinson. And they have no common predators, but some animals have adapted to eating them. We also have a fun fact for you today. Did you know that in the early 1920s in New Jersey area, children were offered 60 cents for every quart of Papilia japonica they would collect? And now it's time for clue number one. It has antennas. Here is the Papilia japonica's life cycle. And here are some fun facts. The Papilia japonica are identified by their color and they eat over 300 species of plants. The first stage to the, the Papilia japonica's life cycle is the egg stage. The egg is about 1 20th to 1 16th inch diameter and the color of the egg is to a creamy white color to a translucent color. The Papilia japonica is in this egg stage in July and to mid-August. Next is the larvae phase. There are three stages in the larvae phase. This is the longest phase because it starts in the end of August and goes through the winter until the beginning of May. In this stage, they eat the roots of crops, grass, and plants. They are also called grubs. The last stage before they turn into adults is called pupa. In this stage, they are in a uh, creamy, like they're in a cocoon like figure and they look they have like a brown to a light brown coloring to them and they are in this stage from early to late May to early June. Finally, adult. The Papilia japonica are 15 millimeters long and 10 millimeters wide. They have an iridescent copper colored body and a green iridescent head. They only live one year in this stage. They are in this stage during June through August. The problem about the Papilia japonica. The Papilia japonica not only causes to the agriculture industry, but another smaller problem is that during our research, we realized only a small percentage of people that we surveyed only know what the Papilia japonica was. According to www.village.lakewood.us, they say that the Papilia japonica is the most widespread turf pest and it costs the turf industry about $450 million a year and that's just for, to manage them and then it costs them about $460 million to conduct experiments and that's just for the adults. Next they are paying about $234 million for the larval stage for, to prevent them and then it also costs them about $156 million to conduct experiments on the larval stage. They aren't going away soon because according to Todd Lorenzo who is from Copper County, Missouri, he says that we should expect an increase of Papilia japonicas for the next seven to ten years 
And this is because they have no common predators. We handed a survey out to the Dakota County farmers and then we analyzed the surveys. So, an entomologist from the University of Wisconsin says that the Papilia japonicas could be a lingering effects of Wisconsin's drought conditions in 2012 to 2013. But that even in micro environments with no drought issues, the Papilia japonicas did not thrive this year. The problem about the Papilia japonica is that they destroy more than 300 crops in Minnesota. The grubs usually eat the roots of the plant and they are really hard to get rid of and they multiply very easily. So as you see right here, a gorgeous rose. This is the before picture. Sadly, right here you can see this murdered flower has been destroyed by these Papilia japonicas. And if we don't do something now, this is what all of our poor flowers will look like. And this is the effects of the Papilia japonica. Here are some more devastating pictures of what these Papilia japonicas did to these poor plants. They destroy many types of plants and crops like corn, roses, soybeans, potatoes, apple trees, and grapes. And then the grubs destroy uh, roots of turf grass and then some roots of certain plants. They destroy it by leaving the leaves on the trees or plants skeletonized. Besides from the leaves, they also eat petals, usually around the edges. The grubs destroy the plants by eating the roots of grass, crops, or flowers. And on grass, you can tell if the grubs ate the roots because it turns brown. Our solution is where we mainly educate the people within our state. Since not a lot of people know what, the, what they are and what they do to our crops. Clue number two. Our team name has something to do with its common name. We have some graphs for you based on a survey that we sent out to farmers in Minnesota. We wanted to ask the farmers in Minnesota about their thought on the Papilia japonica. The main purpose for our survey was to provide how much damage the Papilia japonica actually does around the area. Then after they answered our questions, we made a graph based on the data that we collected. And here's the first graph. Um, as you can see, it's from the question, do you use pesticides? And five of the farmers said yes, two of the farmers said no, and two left it blank. And again, this was taken by farmers. The next graph survey question was, how many farmers know that the Papilia japonica has affected their field or crops? And about 22.2% .2 of the farmers that took the survey know that the Papilia japonica has affected their crop or field, and then about 22.2% .2 of the farmers that took the survey didn't know if the Papilia japonica has or hasn't affected their crops, and then about 55.5% 55 .5 of the farmers that took the survey know that the Papilia japonica has not infested in their garden or field. This is our graph that shows the results to our survey we sent up to nine different farmers who live in Dakota County. It shows the results we got from the survey question, do you know about the Papilia japonica? Here are some organic ways to get rid of the Papilia japonica. This way to get rid of the Papilia japonica is very earth friendly and very time consuming. The supplies that you need for this one is a bucket, soap, and water. So what you do is you fill your bucket with soapy water. Then you head, off to, you head out to your garden. Next, you shake or pick off all the Papilia japonica so that they land in your bucket. Then, then, you pour, then after they are dead, you pour the contents onto your garden, which should discourage any other Papilia japonicas from feasting on your garden. And here's a tip. Do this in the morning because the Papilia japonicas are slower and less alert. And let's say you don't have enough time to do the soapy, uh, the bucket of soapy water method. Well, if you plant chives, garlic, tansy, or catnip around the plants that you want to protect from the Papilia japonica, then that should discourage them also because they don't really like the scent and the taste of those plants. And now it's time for clue number three. Its main color makes it a little challenging to know what type of uh, bug it is. So we researched a little bit about the pesticides for our experiment and we have a, def a couple of different brands for you today. And now it's time for insecticides. So we researched about four different types of insecticides and here they are. So we did pyrethrin based, neem oil, and bioneem. The first one that I'm going to tell you is the pyrethrin based one. 
What is it? Pyrethrum is a power daisy that has been growing for thousands of years. The power daisy grows in climates like China, East Africa, and New Zealand. Did you know that the power daisy plant can produce up to 400 flowers? And those power daisies are very sensitive to soil and to weather conditions. So what are some hazards or downfalls to using this? Well, if you put too little pyrethrum on it, then it'll only knock the bug out for a day or two. And if you put too much, it could harm the ladybird or otherwise known as the ladybug. Most ladybugs are good for the environment, so you don't want to kill them. Pyrethrum can also be harmful to aquatic insects and their predators. Neem oil. What is neem oil? It is an insecticide that is good for the environment and safe for humans, and has no long-term effect on both of the soil or the plant. Neem oil comes from a tree called Azotriac indica from South Asia. Did you know that the, the seeds are used for neem oil? And you may be wondering why we'd use the seeds for neem oil. Well, actually the whole tree contains neem oil, but we use the seeds because they hold more value. Is it safe? There has been studies that have proven that neem oil is safe for all wildlife and has no effects on humans. Neem oil works by going to the plant's, the plant's vascular system, once inside without harming the plant. Once the insect consumes the plant, it makes the insect avoid or stop eating the plant. Next we have bioneem. So what is bioneem? It's another insecticide that is very similar to neem oil. And so you may be wondering how does it work? Well bioneem hurts the insect's hormone balance before it so it dies before reproducing. Bioneem is safe for important insects such as honeybees and ladybugs. The difference between bioneem and neem oil is they are very similar but bioneem hurts the insect's hormone balance so that they die before reproduction and neem oil makes the pest avoid or stop eating the plant. Also bioneem has to be mixed into water whereas neem oil is already in a liquid form. The Papilia japonica trap. The Papilia japonica trap works by luring them in for what's inside they love to consume. Once inside, they can escape and eventually die. And if you are wondering if it is safe, it is safe. Some pros and cons of using this trap is if you live in the cities, it doesn't work as well because you're just attracting more Papilia japonicas to feast on your yard. Well, as if you live in the country, you're more spread out, so you're not attracting as many Papilia japonicas, so it has a better effect. Clue number four. There are two words in its common name. So this is our design process, and now we're going to go a little bit into that. So we identified the problem, which was the Papilia japonica destroys crops, flowers, grass, and more. We brainstormed some possible experiment ideas. Then we designed and built the experiment that we brainstormed on. Finally, we tested the experiment, and if we didn't get the right results, we either redesigned and improved our experiment, or if we got the right results, we will share our solution to people everywhere. Clue number five. It's originally from Japan. In the future. Since the Papilia japonica comes up about this month, we decided on telling you of our future experiment. Our future experiment will be focused more on the adult stage and will involve of the couple's plants that they love to snack on. For our experiment, we have chosen green beans and impatience. Here is a picture of, a, of our example experiment. We're going to have three separate bins, bins of each plant, and then we're going to put the Papilia japonica on each plant, and then we're going to use pesticides, the organic way, and the insecticides. So for the pesticide way, we're going to choose a pesticide and then apply it according to the directions. Next, we are going to count the number of leaves that have been destroyed by the Papilia japonica, and then turn our results into a graph form. Next is our controlled plant. All we give is water and the natural way of planting it. Then after again, we'll count the leaves that have been destroyed and put the results into graph form. And our last plant is the organic way. We're going to use the bucket of soapy water method. And then we're going to treat the plant like that, that has been infected by the Papilia japonica. And then we're going to um, get the results and put it into graph form. Then, after we figure out which is the best way to control the Papilia japonica, we'll share our results to people everywhere. Clue number six, Japan is in its name. And here are the websites that we used for our research. And there's two slides of this.
And then um, uh, for sharing to the community, community uh, we, uh, we're going to share, if we do get good results, we're going to share our results with farmers, small farmers, gardeners, small gardeners, scientists, and colleagues. Here is our presentation dates that we presented into many different people. And the, unli and the underlined means that it benefits them. So we have a short summary of our interview with the Egan Market Fest farmers, and some of them did not know about our bug. So about five farmers have heard or seen the bug, and two farmers doesn't really care but wants to get rid of it. We visited the half a farm stand, and luckily they did know about the bug. Except it doesn't cost them a lot of trouble towards them, and they don't really care, but they would like to get rid of it. But they did see it in the zucchini and cabbages plant, and they did see it flying around a lot. And one challenge that we faced when we were um, interviewing them was that not all the farmers that we interviewed spoke English. Some of them spoke monk, so we had a little bit of trouble um, a asking questions with them. We'd like to give a special thanks to the Ma Dakota County Master Gardeners, Neith Little, Anya Johnson, the Farmers of Minnesota Farm Bureau, and Dave Harem, and they all helped us in an exorbitant amount of ways. And uh, we met with a couple of Master Gardeners and they helped us a lot in uh, several different ways and in one way is that they made us realize that it'll be a little bit challenging to do an experiment because of their life cycle and that it's not just the farmers with the large fields that have a problem with the Papilia japonica, it's also the small gardeners. So we thought it was very important to incorporate 4-H in our project. So we were thinking how can we do this? Well, we took the 4-H pledge and applied all of um, our work towards the pledge and the 4-H's, um, which is the head, the heart, the health, and the hands. And um, you can ask us more about that in the question segment. So here are all the clues that we have that, that have been around our presentation. That is the end of our presentation, and thank you for listening. We hope that you learned something new about the invasive species Papilia japonica. Any questions are welcome, and guesses for guessing the Papilia japonica's common name are encouraged. Thank, thank you. you. My name is Ruth Merrick. I'm with the Minnesota Farm Bureau Federation. Uh, my guess is the Japanese beetle. Yes, you are yes. correct. Yeah, the ja the Japan in the title was kind of a giveaway. Wasn't and it? and so I'm just go ahead. And I I wish I had suckers right now because you guessed it right, but sadly I don't. Um, I'm just curious if um, you know one how why you decided to do it on the beetle itself and if any of you are gardeners and have had problems with it well we actually kind of chose the topic from a process of elimination we kind of narrowed it down to three major groups and then we just basically eliminated it down to there until we got to the Japanese beetle and I thought this was an interesting topic because our person me personally we have a small garden and um, they kind of just destroy these flowers they kind of like would ruin them so we'd have to take the entire plant out and it was kind of a big problem because those um, we really liked the flowers in our yard so we actually tried the um, trap and it actually always filled up all the time and so we had to keep getting new bags, so I really wanted to learn more about it to see if there was a more effective way to get rid of them. And I also was in a Master Gardener's class through 4-H, and they said it was a huge problem and to watch out for them in your garden. So I also was really curious, curious about this. Hi, I'm Amy Smith. I'm one of the Ag Ed faculty members here at the U of M. Um, so very interesting stuff. I was curious about the survey that you distributed to, there was like nine individuals that received that survey. Yep. Can you tell us a little bit more about who those individuals were and how you selected those? Were they both farmers that had conventional crops or were they small scale gardeners and how might you 
change or replicate that or do do that aspect of the project differently or better in the future well um uh for the uh present like you know for the survey uh we handed out the surveys at the like the farm bureau and um and most of the farmers had like a huge field and uh most of them had over 10 years of experience with farming and uh, they didn't say whether they did like conventional or not are there uh this is adam burr with minnesota corn growers uh did you look at any national or state surveys that have been done to look at how prevalent japanese beetles are and kind of related to that i see you had some extension folks mentioned there i know there's some cropping uh, entomologists with extension out there did you consult with any of them to, to see what a how pervasive this is in minnesota uh we tried to connect more like outside of the state around county but we were having a really hard time trying to contact them and we didn't have a lot a lot of time to fit in all of the schedule times because since individuals of us we have a lot of activities so we did try but hopefully we will do better maybe next year. Yeah, I'm Mark Hammerlake, Minnesota Corn Growers. Uh, two things that I remember you mentioning, uh, uh, one is that w when you were talking to folks at the farmer's market that they had noticed uh, a Japanese beetle around uh, a certain number of vegetables. And secondly, I had some, uh, you said you had some challenges in speaking to a lot of the gardeners here because they were Hmong and there was a, uh, there was a language barrier. Do you have any thoughts on uh, on uh, how you might overcome that? I mean, you've got good information here, uh, but uh, breaking down that barrier, I'm just curious if you've given any thought to that. We actually did before we um, went to the farmer's market because um, I have a farm next to like my house and they don't speak English. So we thought that might be a problem. So we actually printed out pictures of what they looked like so that we could show the farmers so in case they did not speak English that they would be able to look at that and say like if they had it or not. One, uh, Ruth Merrick, Minnesota Farm Bureau. Another question that I have for you is all of your management solutions had to do once with the, the beetle once it was in the adult cycle of, of its life. Did you have any solutions for when it was in the larvae or under the ground or any types of solutions for that? Well, there are some solutions. Like uh, one is putting in this uh, certain type of larvae from a different bug, except for that could become a problem in your yard. And we didn't feel like that was, you know, ter terribly important. But, you know, it's actually really hard to get rid of the grubs in the grub stage because they're in grub, like the larval stage during winter, and it's hard to dig up the ground and stuff. So, you mean you could try putting this uh, bug's larvae in the ground, but then it might become a problem. Uh, that bug might become part of a problem also. And also you can't really do much for the grub stage because they're in the ground so if you like tried to like put pesticides or something on that the ground would just soak it up and that could potentially be harmful to the plant. So there's not really much you can do but I think that would be an interesting topic to look into.